All right, I'm here with Rick Blasey, and Rick is the, uh, what is your title at Mallow Creek? So my, my title, I think officially it's uh, uh, Pastor of Discipleship with a comma, and then especially in adult ministry. Yeah, and you do a lot with the college ministry up there as Yeah, well. basically when you graduate high school, I get you, and then um, until yeah. glory. So Well, one of the things that we've been trying to do this year is, is we bring in other people, uh, pastors here at the church, because we believe theologically they're on the right page. And uh, during our Wednesday mornings, we always have a devotion. And this year we chose for our devotions to, to focus on the catechisms. Now, a lot of this, a lot of people won't, don't know this, but Rick is really the brainchild for us in doing this because uh, you did a lot of catechism work. You, you've kind of written a, a study guide that you use with the college kids up at Mallard Creek. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of that kind of inspired us to do the same thing here. And so we looked at the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I think that's what's in your book. Uh, yeah. Slight variations. Slight yeah. variations. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're teaching about 30 of those questions because we believe the theological concepts, the foundational stuff is what you need to be successful as parents. And so you spoke this morning on question number six. That's right. That's right. And uh, it, the question is, why don't you just tell us what the question and answer is? So the question is, how many persons are there in the Godhead? And uh, um, the, the answer is longer. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's uh, basically the answer says there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they exist in uh, the same substance and equal in power and glory. Okay. And that, that, that seems pretty theologically deep. Yeah. Uh, but this is something that you've actually used with your own family. And uh, yeah. growing up, you taught your kids the catechisms, something that's a little uncommon for Baptists, but Baptists seem to be embracing it more now but is more common with Presbyterians and Catholics and uh, Lutherans and Anglicans. But you did this with your children growing up. Can you share a little about that? Yeah, I mean, I got saved at 20 um, and then got married pretty soon after that, maybe 24, 25 years old when I got married. And um, then I, didn't, I, had no, I had no concept of how to disciple my own children. Um, I didn't, it wasn't kind of modeled in my home. Not that my parents are bad people. We just didn't sit around and talk about the Bible. Um, so I didn't really know what to do, and I was trying to figure out how to decipher my own kids, and my own family. And it, pretty much at an early age, I found this little small book. Uh, I think it's called Big Truths of Little Kids, and it had the catechisms in it. <clears throat> they were very short uh, questions and answers, and it was kind of the shorter version of the Westminster Shorter Catechisms. Uh, so it was a little bit, there's a kid's version to the uh, catechisms. And so we kind of, from the early age, I mean, they could barely talk and we'd be around the dinner table and we would do the questions. We do three questions every night, mm. uh, what we did. So we do three questions, we repeat the uh, question and the answer and we would memorize them together. Okay, and so, you know, as, as a dad, I struggled with the same thing. How do I do some type of foundational devotion, mm -hmm. something that's theological with my kids? And we struggle with that. And so that's kind of the resource that we're trying to put together this year is teaching parents how to do that. So how successful was it? Do you think that it was useful and successful? And what tips would you give in parents that are looking to do something similar? Well, the tips I'd give is like, you know, don't, you know, put so much pressure on yourself that if you don't do it every night, you're some kind of sinner. Um, our pattern was easier when our kids were small. We had control of their schedule. We, you know, we controlled every when they ate and what they ate and all those kind of things. Uh, when sports started to enter the world, uh, the Blasey household, we, we had less control. Um, of course, I was the director of rec, so I scheduled our practices on Tuesday nights. So yeah. uh, we could kind of work around it a little bit, but <clears throat> uh, we kind of got in rhythm where once a week, uh, we'd have um, kind of discussion around the dinner table about these things. Uh, so that's how we laid it out. We started to do the questions. The questions themselves breed conversation. Mm. It's like, what does it mean when it says this word, same substance? Or what does it mean when it, it says God created all things? Uh, what, what does it mean? Um, whatever the question may be when, uh, I mean, I had a four-year-old that could, that could tell you what the atonement meant. Christ satisfied God's wrath on behalf of sinners. 
And I got a four-year-old telling me this when I'd ask her the question, what is meant by the atonement? Yeah. So they can memorize it and they can, you know, but it's, it's they're internalizing deeper truths yeah. that they may not understand fully at the moment, but I could ask my same college student today what we used to talk about over the dinner and she would still know the answer and would mean different things to her today. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of built this bedrock of, of understanding of deeper theological truths that I knew one day would, would come into play in their life. You know, it's, I mean, I love the word of God. The word of God is important. The memorizing the word of God is, is the, like one of the most important things you can do in disciplines. Uh, but this kind of gave a, you know, a, a reason to, to go to the word of God. Yeah. Like this kind of gave a question, like, what does that mean? And where do I find my answers? And the answers are always in the scriptures. It kind of pushes you to that. Well, it seems like for our parents, you know, I, I think I'm going to take what he said and I'm going to sum it up into two things. Number one, you said pressure. Don't feel a whole lot of pressure. Oh, man, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the pressure to know these deep theological truths, uh, they take a lifetime to, to master and then you don't really have them mastered. I think that as a parent, I felt a lot of pressure. And so I think a lot of our parents will feel that same pressure. But the second thing that you said that I think is, probably the, the best takeaway is you just need to have conversations with the kids. Mm -hmm. And if you've got some questions and answers that you can go with that allows for these conversations, uh, it's something that will stick with them. You said that, you know, even today, my college kids, I can ask them those questions and they remember those conversations, mm -hmm. but they also remember the theology that's behind. Them. So yeah. that would be my recommendation. Is there anything you would add to that for parents that would help them yeah. in this journey? Yeah, I think that the you know the best thing for me uh, was I didn't have to know the answers because the answers are it's the question and the answer that's built in, so it tells you everything. Now there are some questions that came from from those things, but um, you know usually you're smarter than your kids, yeah. uh, so you can kind of figure it out. But it, it's also so, but... it's it's also an opportunity for you to be vulnerable yeah. and say I don't know. Let's let's figure that out together. And so they get to see you grow in this knowledge and they grow in the knowledge. And now they, they have a, a really uh, deep understanding and have something to attach that to. So I think that's helpful. So I, I just don't be afraid to do it and, and try it out and risk it, you know, for you know, putting yourself in a situation where you might not know how to answer one of the questions your kids have. That's okay. It's not, it's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. In fact, it gives them some hope. Yeah. And well, Rick, I appreciate you coming by. Thank you for sharing with the high school kids this morning. I yeah, know man. that they benefit from that. And so if you don't have a church home, there's a campus up at Mallard Creek. Of course, we have the one here at Harris. And if you want to learn more on how to do that, you can check out our Substack blog or go to one of our churches and learn from the pastors themselves. But thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah.